Hi, we're on the air. Hi, I'm Marguerite Ashton. Thank you for joining me here. I'm with two awesome ladies who are in law enforcement. They're also members of the Crime Writers Panel. And we're going to talk tonight about fact versus fiction and creating your female detective. And we also have another surprise. Um, after I, I came up with the topic, we received a lot of requests from writers about this particular subject and also uh, misconce misconceptions surrounding women in law enforcement. And so we're going to bring those two together and have fun. We should be able to answer any questions that you may have and hopefully this will help you with any of your writing that you are currently doing or any of your research. So first of all I want to introduce um, uh, Kathleen Ryan. She is um, a retired, am I saying this right? Sopel, so why can I get it? Sopel County? What is Sopel County. Yes. Sopel County, okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Police officer on Long Island. Mm -hmm. um, during her 21 um, year career, she worked on patrol, public information, and crime stoppers. Now, she also volunteers with the board of directors and um, of crime stoppers, and she's also known on the personal side. She has been brave enough to discuss it. She's also a breast cancer survivor. And so she has a long list in her bio of everything that she does. Mm -hmm. so you can check out her website. And um, also here on the other side we have Susie Ivy. She's so active and um, she has, I love hearing her story when she went into the police academy. She was 45 years old when she decided to make that decision and getting shape and it's in the police academy so um, it will be a lot of fun. Now both these ladies have information for us writers that I think we really need to listen to and we're all, we're all here to have fun. So ladies thank you for being here with me mm -hmm. and <laughs> um, Kathy why don't you um, tell us a little bit about yourself before we um, move on here. Okay. Um like I said, I uh, it actually was 27 years ago that I was sworn in in the Suffolk County Police Department as a police officer. Um, it is approximately, I think, somewhere around the 10th, 11th, or 12th uh, largest police department in the United States. So it is, it is quite a big um, police department. Um, when I joined in 1986, there might have been 70 um, female officers on, you know, on the job. So uh, there were a lot of obstacles to overcome. I thought, I thought maybe the academy was going to be difficult, but actually, they were right in on the ground floor with us. You know, they had to, you know, do their push-ups and sit-ups and get good grades and shine their shoes, and they weren't under the same pressure as we were. It wasn't until I gotten into the the uh, precinct when I met uh, what we affectionately call dinosaurs. Those are usually people with 20 or 30 or 40 years on the job. And they didn't come out and say it, but I, I could see what they wanted to say somewhere along the lines of, we never had females on the job before and we don't need them now. And I thought, well, even if I agreed with them and said, okay, I'll leave, it was a tide that was coming in and me leaving wasn't going to stop it. So, And it was a job that I really wanted to do. And um, you have to have a lot of confidence because, um, you know, I, I, was, I was afraid, you know, before I came on. I, I had a lot of self-doubt. Can I do this? Am I capable? It was my mother that... So... Um, I enjoyed it, and uh, over the years, uh, you know, it would raise its uh, ugly head, you know, whether it would be people on the job or, or the public about having females on the job. Mm -hmm. But uh, we just tried to do the job the best to our ability. Actually, we had to do it like twice as good to be, you know, uh, accepted. You felt like you had to go above and beyond just to be able to do the same job the guys were doing. But um, I'm curious to hear also from Susie how it is now and I give her a lot of credit for starting it. 
at an age like when I was saying goodbye to him. <laughs> so I'm very curious to see how that's going. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kathleen. So, all right, now, so Susie, it's your turn here. Tell us, tell us. <laughs> okay, well, I I loved how Kathleen said that the police academy um, seemed to come easy. I think she said it some way, shape, or form. Hardest thing I ever did in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, you know, no, and I, no doubt, no doubt, it okay. was hard, but it was like how the men accepted us. You know, oh, I, okay. I was and anticipating. You know, you know that they would give us a hard time, but they didn't. They didn't. But it was yeah. hard. Absolutely. It, okay. All right. I'm so glad to hear that. Yes. <laughs> and, and you know, Ooh. police officers, whether you're male or female, you tend to be. Um, you know, you're. I don't want to say you're a poor loser, but you want to win. And so that was really hard for me to get used to because my whole life I was good in sports. Um, I was used to coming in first place. I was at the top of everything that I, I tended to do. And then at 45, I went to the police academy. And especially when it came to physical fitness with all the 20-year-old men, I was in last place. I mean dead last. Very difficult to, to get past that and to learn to accept that, you know what, I can still be good even coming in last. Um, thank goodness, academics and shooting I did not come in last. I did very well. <laughs> but, mm. but when it came to the physical, you know. Oh, I was the first female officer. I was actually the first one in our entire county. Um, there is one more that works for the county now. Um, I work, you know, of course, for the police department, and I am the only female. Um, we've we've had two that have come and have gone, um, but it, it's still. I think it's still tough today. It it. I don't want to say it hasn't changed because things have changed a lot. Um, but. I still face some of the same challenges. Um, the new, a new group of, of younger police officers that come in. You, you have to prove yourself. I don't think the other men have to prove themselves. Mm -hmm. Women have to. You have to prove yourself over and over Above and, and over. Exactly. Yep, and you do, and that just doesn't stop. Um, so you, you basically, you do it. You actually kind of get used to it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I hate to say that. But that, that's what that's what we do and you know if we stay in this for very long we get darn good at it mm. I, I give you a lot of credit and to be a ground a groundbreaker that you are to, to you know be the one to blaze that trail and and be the first female so congratulations on that well thank you <laughs> yeah now absolutely now there's one thing because while I have I think there's one of the things that now, from Susie um, works in the smaller town, and Kath, you, was that, that was the bigger that was the bigger department, correct? You was oh, in the yeah. bigger police department, right? Yeah. Now, is it? Here's a question, and this is one question. So I want to ask: Is this, is there a difference with how a criminal investigation case is handled, small town versus the bigger city, um, and how it's done? Is there a difference? Can I answer this, Kat? Do you mind? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, at least from my perspective, I'll answer from the small police department. Um, you know what? We do everything. And I finally, two years ago, um, got my forensic certification. Um, we do everything from collecting DNA, um, fingerprint. When I say we, I'm the only detective. I do everything. I take all my own pictures. I collect all my own evidence. I bag all my own evidence. Um, you know, I get it to the crime lab. I drive it to the crime lab, which is two and a half hours away. Um, you know, I do from start to finish. When I have a big case, um, it's nothing for me to be up for 72 hours with maybe five hours of sleep in that time. Um, you know, and talking from people from larger departments, and I'll let Kat take over from here, I think there is a big difference. Oh yeah, absolutely, because we have so many units that take care of all the different steps. You know, um, again, that's a tremendous amount of work that you're doing on your own, 
And again, I applaud you for that. That's that that's a lot to have to deal with on your own. But we have different units to handle different parts. You know, on, on patrol, if I were to get a call, where um, you know it could be an apparent natural um, death, but mm -hmm. you never know. You have to treat each one as if it could be because it may turn out to be, you know, that they were poisoned or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to take each case as if this could be something that's going to go to court and prosecutable or we're going to find an arrestee. But, um, you know, as a patrol officer, if we have a scene like that, um, you know, we have to have a supervisor come down and um, then we have to call out the, the unit. You know, it might be uh, the detective squad, so they have to come down. And... Um, then maybe the DA's office, people might want to come from there. Um, then the media is another thing. And we have uh, PIOs or the public information officers that come to the scene to help as a liaison so that the detectives working the scene don't have Okay, they'll make a statement at whatever time because they have deadlines and uh, the media is part of it. That, that's never going to end. Um, and then, you know, uh, I have crime scene detectives come down to process the scene, um, you know, or photograph it. Um, th there's just so many uh, different parts. So we're, we don't have to do what you're, you're doing like a jack of all trades. You know, you really... Yeah. Uh, you, you know how important it is. It's it's the um, the chain of evidence. You know that yes. that you're preserving. So, mm -hmm. um, but for the patrol officer, when when that scene is secured and everything, they they go back to answering 911 calls, whereas the detectives have to pick up where you know doing the things that that you have to do. So you know, I think you're bringing up a good point though, and a lot of writers, um, I see this missed a lot. Um, of course, I stand on the detective side of it, but the patrol side of it is down there in the nitty-gritty. I get more information from my patrol officers and having a good relationship because they will, they will call me. They'll give me inside tips of, of things they've seen, things that are going on, seems that, things that seem odd. And, you know, in a lot of the trainings I go to, when I go to the, the more advanced detective trainings, they're always telling you, work with your patrol. Work with those officers. They they are going to give you more information than you can possibly get from any place else. And that is something that we, we see missed in the books. You're either a police officer, patrol officer, sheriff, whatever, or you're a detective, you're a supervisor, mm -hmm. you know, in the books. And I don't think people realize how much these sections work have to work together. Right, I, you make a great point because um, if you're talking about a patrol officer that's had their beat for the two, four, four, ten, twelve years, they do know their area and uh, yeah. they are well versed in it. Um, so uh, they do have a plethora of information because that's that's how they uh, can sometimes make arrests is by knowing, you know, the uh, the people in your area because um, there's it's it's one it's a war story that I'd like to tell. I was training someone. I was an FTO, which is a field training officer, as you know. Um, and we had to go to a different channel to run some data because a, a car was blocking um, an exit. And so I went down to that channel and I heard my partner in another area running this guy that I knew his name. I said, uh-oh, because it was during school, I knew he was a high school student, and I'm thinking, what is he doing out this time of day? So I got a hold of that uh, officer, and I said, where are you? He told me the road, and I said, I I'm just about to finish this call. I'm coming down there. So we did, and uh, like I said, I was training this other officer, and I said, let's let's talk to the people in the car. There was like four, four teenagers in the car, and I they've been arrested before. So I asked them, what are you doing?
a TV and a VCR in the woods. So um, I called the detectives and I said, we have proceeds from um, a burglary. We just don't know who got you know their house uh, broken into yet. And um, I was there with the officer I was training and my part, you know, the partner that I originally had gone down to help. And we were up on the top of a hill on a um, on a on a dead end, and a car came up, kind of like saw us, and did a quick turn and left. I was kind I was stuck at the scene, so I asked my partner. I said, "Could could you follow that person? Just go after them. Just pull them over, because I, I think they're up to something here." And sure enough, it turned out to be the kid's father who was going to be there to pick up the TV and the VCR. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, I, by the time I got relieved, because it was an 8 to 4, um, I warned my 4 to 12 relief. I said, you're probably going to get a call, you know, that someone's house was broken into. And they did. And this was the rare occasion to say, uh, yeah, we recovered your stuff. <laughs> We've identified the <laughs> <laughs> So um, the detectives wrote us up for a commendation because we knew the, I knew the area so well. And we wrote those, you know, pieces of paper that put them in the time and the place, plus the 911 uh, call that came in. So they, they got, you know, quite a few uh, felony arrests out of it. So that came from knowing my area so well and knowing something's out of place. And I think you know, most cops are really good at spotting something that's not supposed to be there. When if you're riding right. along somebody else, that they, they, you know, they don't see a difference. They don't see a difference. But... The more you know your area, the more things will pop out at you, and that was a, a great example of it. But you know, when your antenna just pops up and says, uh, uh, "Something's wrong with that," but so we'll get a string of we'll get a go go ahead, Margaret. I'm sorry. Um, no problem. Now I think I don't know who it. I had to come back in, so bear with us, viewers. We're having some technical difficulties. Now, did I leave because I had to click back in? What happened? And you guys are awesome. Did you guys notice I was gone? I, I think... I, go ahead. In the, the corner of my screen, it shows when you're gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, so bear with me. I'm not trying to, you know, suck out of the thing. Oh, I, no, I that's okay. <laughs> We've also got a rainstorm, so it's like, oh, are you kidding me? Oh, you're getting the storm now. You're bad. You're bad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, and I know that that was um, sort of off topic, but that question has come in three times um, this evening, and I wanted to ask that real quick, so thank you guys for helping me um, getting that answered. Now, so we'll get on track here with the fact versus fiction, creating your female detective. And I think one of the um, things that are not, for instance, we believe what we see on TV, especially with regards to how females may dress, um, <laughs> low-cut blouses, heels, you name it, whatever. So... Um, with research I've done and when I work down at the public defender's office and doing intake down at the I know that is so not true. Um, YouTube, please help me um, clear this up. What is the best way? First of all, when we're beginning our story and we have to make a well-rounded character, what is the best thing um, for us to start off with? What do you suggest, Kat? Um, you want me to, I'll go first. Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, what people see on TV and in the movies, um, they have to know it's it's purely entertainment. So uh, that you got That that's what that is about. Mm -hmm. And sadly, people do believe it. You know, they think, oh yeah, you know, they wear high heels and low cut blouses. When meanwhile, you know, I'm wearing um, like I might have a, a bra, a t-shirt. A bulletproof vest, then my uh, uniform shirt, and depending on the season, a tie, and the gun belt, and it, it's so much stuff, you know. And I guess it's not sexy. So um, on television, they have to make it sexy. But uh, yeah, I get a good laugh out of it sometimes when you see, oh, you know, nobody would ever be dressed like that. But again, it's Hollywood. So um, I guess that's the first thing that um, it's just pure entertainment it doesn't have to be accurate and that's what hurts us 
you know, it's, it's just like what they call the CSI effect, where now juries believe that things can be wrapped up really quickly and everything gets uh, DNA tested, and that may not be the case. But they want to believe what they read and see. you know, whether they want them to be appropriately dressed or they want to do something else. I guess if it's an undercover, there's definitely some leeway there. But for uniform, there's no way around it. Now, for, um, so, well, okay, for the uniformed office, they have their uniforms. For the female detective, is there a, what is the, common sense reality that we as writers should just know. I mean, what I mean is, you know, I'm not going to run around in heels if I'm chasing a suspect type of thing. What do you, is there something that can help us? Um, you know, it, especially if I'm called out in the middle of the night, um, I dress for comfort. I still will bring my best um, but more than anything, and I, I really have never run into this in a book, um, is that I wear pockets. I have pockets everywhere. My pockets are filled with so much crap, it's unbelievable. I have BDU pants that have nothing but pockets in them. I have a pocket vest. I have um, extra gloves that, that fit in back pockets of my vest. I mean, there, you know, I, I have a, a small pocket knife. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. I, just the different tools, the different things I have because I hate backing out of a scene. I hate taking off my booties, um, you know, having to re-put on booties, having to redo everything when I don't have stuff there with me. So, so I have enough to get through a basic crime scene on my body. Um, it makes me look like um, I'm a homeless person with, mm -hmm. with um, a lot of stuff stuck yes. around. <laughs> but that's what works for me, and I, I think that that writers need um, first off, you know, there there are books out there um, written by women about you know women detectives, um, and there's a new one I haven't read yet, and I and for of course I cannot think of the name of it, and that I really have to read. But um, but I think as female police. little tidbits in a book make people think you really know what you're talking about. If, if, you, if you can add some of that inside, um, I get asked a lot, um, you know, police officers, if you call your local police department and tell them you're a writer and you want to talk to them, um, they'll talk to you. They love to talk. They love to think that they would be in a book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and, you know, even if you just sent like a chapter and said, hey, did I get this right? they're gonna tell you you got it right and you know and like I said I, I think that I'm thrilled anytime anybody asks me and um, just having a little bit of that inside little stuff really helps. Oh and I agree and I think um, the Susie if you remember a while back when we first talked and we did one of one of the interviews with you you um, told us to do the exact same thing to call your local police department mm -hmm. and I took you up on that. That was one of the coolest things for me um, to, I had a question but, but it, this goes back to the first one that I asked you guys in the beginning about the difference between um, big cities and small towns. Is there a difference? And so, and that's how I found that out. I called them up, you know, of course being um, polite, I did state that I was an author and he had a ball just explaining <laughs> and talking with me yeah. <laughs> about that. And of course, you know, I didn't know what he's going to say. Is the, this woman's crazy? Is she really calling the police station to ask this question? But <laughs> it worked. So, you know, thank you for that, too. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think that if we can just, it all goes back to research and making sure that our books are accurate because 
even though we don't want to bore them with all of the uh, facts, but we do want it to be true. You want words like um, spatter versus splatter. You have to use the correct word, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, Uh oh, can you guys hear me? Cause I, I can hear now. I, okay, because it was frozen for a second. Was it frozen okay. for you? I, I, yes, it was. Marguerite. Did we lose Marguerite. I have I have Marguerite on the screen, but she's frozen. I have her on the screen too. Okay, and it's still showing that we're on air. So I guess it's up to you and I to talk. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can we can you talk. Know, well. Did you ever get phone calls as a place at your police department? Um, I mean, you oh. know, people asking you, you know, writing questions, or especially since you went online and kind of put yourself out there. Yeah, um, well, I worked with uh, public information, uh, which, you know, it's a liaison between the department and the media. And right. I would include, you know, writers as part of that. Um, and we have uh, R&Ps or as like policy questions that we would defer to right. the chief of the department so that yes. they don't want us talking about stuff like that because mm -hmm. you know it could it could get you in trouble but um, if it's you know something basic like it is a writer and saying you know if I had a cop um, you know doing this or that or they had a second weapon would this sound feasible or you know I'm sure uh, it it, it may, you know, they, their their antennas might go up if you say, if I want to kill someone and I want to poison them, you know, whoops, <laughs> then you might get in trouble. But um, you know, I, I think like Marguerite said and you said too. I you, sometimes you get some t cops talking and they won't stop. Yeah, there's plenty. So true. And if 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 unfortunately you know someone a writer does try and they get the bad apple that you know is giving them a hard time, don't give up. You know, mm -hmm. you'll you'll find someone that'll talk to you, um, and they they may feel more comfortable in saying, "Well, off the record, this is really just in general. I'm just trying to find out would a cop ever say this, or would they do this?" Because I've helped a lot of sisters in crime when they're writing their books. Mm -hmm. um, they've asked me questions. You know, how would this be handled? And usually, it's um, uh, it's it's not a one-word answer. <laughs> You know, it just never is. Right. Like, uh, well, it depends. You know, who called? Who made the call to nine one one? That might make a difference. And I will tell them what they need to know. But I also give them that caveat. I said, you know, I know that this might mess up your plot the way you wanted it if you have to do it the quote right way. And right. there is, I mean, there's var variations between departments whether it's small or big or whatever, even two big departments, they may do it totally mm -hmm. different. So, um, like I said, it never hurts. Um, you know, a writer could, could try the public information route. You know, they could call up a department and say, do you have, uh, you know, a public information officer? It, it might be civilian, it might be, uh, you know, sworn. But um, you can just tell them who you are and what you'd like to do, and I'm sure they'll, they'll put you in the right direction and get somebody to talk to you. So. Okay. Great. And I think that's one of the things, too, I do, um, where, where where can we find the balance when we're doing the research um, with other law enforcement officers so that we can get a, um, a specific scene, get it written the correct way. Um, I think I cringe sometimes when certain questions are asked of the law enforcement because they know there's just some things that you um, can't say. You have to be careful what you, what, what you say. But what else would you suggest to for other resources? Is there anything else that we can do um, that would make um, it a little easier or I'm sure add I to the research? Yeah, I don't, I don't know offhand, but I'm sure that there are, there are many, many uh, police blogs out there. You know, I was going to mention blogs too. Yeah, there's so many. 
Yeah. And a lot of them are willing to, you know, you could you could um, email them off the side or something like that. Or maybe there are some blogs that occasionally take questions. Mm -hmm. And they may do video, you know, podcasts or something. They actually take that question and they do a, you know, maybe it's a 10-minute thing on, on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say police blogs, uh, even just doing a Google search, um, you might stumble upon something you didn't know existed. Uh, also, I mean, you know, most of uh, the police departments, you know, officers have unions. So you, you could try the PBA, you know, try that. You know, they might have uh, people in their office that are willing to do that. Again, as long as it's not, it's not too specific, it's not talking right. about right. policy per se because right. they're afraid that if you give something and it's wrong and that could really hurt. Right. But if right. you're just looking to validate you know, what your scene is and would this be proper or would they react this way or wouldn't they? Um, and it's funny because there's one thing that bothers the hell out of me out of every TV and movie scene I've ever seen. I've never seen anybody get this right yet. And it's when uh, the officer is confronted with a bad guy or girl and they actually, they hold their weapon all out, you know, extended in front of them. Um, and it's right like near the face of the bad guy, and they can grab it. You know, they can grab it. So, I'm like, when is anyone ever gonna like hold the gun back or to their waist or their hip as we're trained? You you don't hold the gun right in front of their face. They're gonna grab it. I have never seen anybody get that right. Bugs the hell out of me. I'm like, wow, don't, how's that one getting passed? You know, they don't do that. So. I, it, oh. You said it before, it just doesn't look as sexy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that seems to be what Hollywood is all about in some of the detective books. Um, you know, one of my big pet peeves that, that I hear, I just read this in a book the other day, it's so hard not to write the author, um, <laughs> but the 48-hour um, missing persons rule. I don't know about you, Kathleen, but... Mm -hmm. As long as I've been in law enforcement, there is no 48-hour no, missing persons isn't. rule. And no law enforcement tells you to wait 48 hours. If you've got somebody missing, you need to inform people right away. And that's a huge misconception that even people who come into the police department and they'll say, look, my brother's been missing for, for two days now. I didn't come to you because they have to be missing for 48 hours. I want to strangle this person. <laughs> I know. It's, it's sad. And, and, you know, the reality is. is either we can take a missing persons report or we can't, you know, sometimes because adults can leave whenever they want, right. but it's usually, you know, are they on medication and, and they left their medication behind? Um, are they disabled in some way? Are they Alzheimer's? You know, are they diabetic? Mm -hmm. Usually, right. you know, it's going to fit one of those parameters and we're going to take a report right away, but you're absolutely right. There's no, quote, waiting period. It's either if it's like it's somebody who just decided to leave, and there's no health reasons, um, you know, there's, there's, they have no kids, there's nothing holding them back. They can kind of go whenever they want, really. Mm -hmm. There has to be, a, you know, a reason to take a missing persons report. But there is no, as you said, there's no waiting period. Use call. She's back. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> we missed you. <laughs> well, uh, I don't think Google Plus likes me, nor does this storm. I'm sorry, guys. That's okay. okay. <laughs> I think you two have got it, though. You've got no it. Um, <laughs> so, um, what I wanted to ask with the female, um, when
when creating the female detective, there's one thing that I was wondering, when we're writing your um, scene, your book, your entire book, is there a POV that you believe works best in the book? Um, maybe Kathleen. I, I no, no. I think that crime fiction is usually written in several POVs, but is there a specific one that you think reads better? Um, I, you know, that first person is going to put you obviously in their head, and then, but it restricts you because it only has to be through that point of view of that character. Um, third person, of course, gives you a lot more um, latitude. So. And I think sometimes uh, good advice is if, if you're writing in third person and you, you're not liking it or you're having a tough time, switch it to first person. And you may say, oh, that, that was really what I needed to do. Uh, you know, because the, the reader is taking, you know, they're kind of on your shoulders and taking the ride with you and your journey through your eyes. So I, I don't think there's, you know, one way's wrong, one way's better or something like that. So that's my two cents on that. I agree. Um, I totally agree with that. Um, mine, of course, are written from my perspective um, with my cases, so I use first person, but I also write fiction, um, just not crime fiction, but I write fiction. Um, I, I tend to, I write paranormal, and I, I tend to put a lot of blood and guts, which comes from the crime I can still read both. You know, I can write both. I can I can read both. Hi, Marguerite. <laughs> I think we lost her again for a few minutes there. So, does that answer your question, Marguerite, about first or third? I mean, I, like I said, there's no right or wrong. I think it's whatever the uh, author is comfortable with. You know, I think right. writers would like either way. I don't. I don't see. One I agree. Being wrong. Mm. I agree. I was just wondering if there was um, a, a preference for a reading because I've had uh, you know some questions and I'm well. Oh, I don't know. For me, writing um, in third um, works for me. Um, so I, I just wasn't sure if there's a um, a um, preferred POV that you guys would probably suggest to write in. Um, Susie, is your the books that you wrote, that's just, that, that first person? Yes. That's from your point of view, correct? It is. Okay. And it, because I'm telling my story, and I do mm -hmm. completely tell it from, from my point of view. Um, and, um, and, and I was saying when you went off air that, you know, I also write fiction that I write from at third person. So, um, oh, okay. you know, mm -hmm. in my bad luck stories, it, it's just, it's about me, what I've done, um, you know, what's happened, and I do write in first person. So I'm, I'm comfortable with both of them. And I'm, I, I really, I probably enjoy reading first person more, though. Okay. All right. I want to ask, what would be, um, and this is a question for each of you, what would be, <laughs> there's no perfect of the characters because then that means they're boring, so we know that. <laughs> <laughs> For a, to help writers, um, if you can give maybe a few suggestions on what would be the best way to, what characteristics should your um, female detective have? Do you have any ideas or suggestions that you can give? Please. <laughs> You want to um, go first, Susie? Go first. Sure. I will go first on this one. Okay. Um, you know what? I I do like imperfect characters. I am so imperfect. I make mistakes. Um, I like when when I read about someone and and those mistakes come out. Of course, in my mind, um, I know I've made the mistake. And I'm talking about actually being out at a scene, actually handling a case. Um, cops 
once you've been in it for several years, you learn not to ever let anybody know um, when you're winging it. Um, you may have doubt in your head. You, you know, every time you think you've handled every situation out there, something comes along that you have no clue, and you, it's your WTF moment, mm -hmm. and and it seriously is, and you wing it. But the most important thing you can do at that point is not to let anybody know that's actually what's happening. And make the people around you feel secure. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in writing the character, just little things like that thrown in, self-doubt. You know, there's been plenty of times I, I have self-doubt over what I've done. Um, yeah, I've had to, heck, I've had to get up on the witness stand, you know, and I've had to admit my mistakes. Um, not easy to do when you've got a major trial. Um, we always make mistakes. So do not make your character perfect or even close to perfect. Make them human. And whether you're a man or female writer, you're not human either. Bring some of yourself into a character. Imagine yourself being a police officer or being in this situation. Make Bring your humanity in. And, and I think especially from women in law enforcement, um, we've got a little bit more of that humanity bubble in us than a lot of men. Um, and I'm not knocking, I've run into some absolutely incredible men, um, male detectives who um, I just, I worship the ground they walk on. But, um, but they'll also tell you that they're not perfect. I, I, I agree with everything you said. Absolutely, um, you can't make anyone perfect. That would be boring. And I think the reader uh, will definitely identify with a cop that, um, you know, is uh, worried about something or is unsure of themselves because everybody has been in, in those shoes. You know, oh, what the heck am I going to do? And also it kind of brings them down off a pedestal because some people do. They look up to cops. They think they're perfect. They think, you know, they'll know what to do. And uh, like Marguerite said, you know, at least look like you still know what you're doing. So they're, that, you know, they're not going to panic, you know. You, you know. <laughs> so, yes, it be like, you have to tap dance, you know, and I had to do that on yes. live television <laughs> <laughs> for like seven and a half minutes long. <laughs> and it was, oh, but I had to tap dance, and really, ooh, that's tough. But, um, yeah, you got to get through it, but look like and sound like you know what you're doing. You know, that that's yes. the trick. Um, but uh, also, um, you see, I, I noticed a lot of the little things too, like when I was at what they call an aided case, and basically what that is is if, because some people go, I, what is that, but different departments call it different things. But an aided case is when someone uh, calls 911 because maybe somebody fell and broke their ankle, or uh, maybe it's a heart attack, it could be as serious as that. Um, and I went, and it was a woman who, I. I don't remember exactly. It wasn't as serious as a heart attack, but she wasn't doing well. I was waiting for the um, ambulance to come, and um, I could tell that she was really she was hurting. You know, like she was sweating and everything. And first of all, I, well, I had a male partner, and there were a lot of family members too. And I was like, could could we get a cold compress for her as we're waiting for the ambulance to come? And also, maybe could someone stand outside to wave down the ambulance? Because sometimes people are guilty of not having their number on their house or their mailbox. Mm -hmm. So while there's 10 of you standing around, can someone stand around outside, wave them down? And also, you know, does this woman, does she, I noticed she had a cat and she lived alone. And I said, you know, she may be in the hospital for a few days. Who knows? Is there someone in the family that could take care of that cat? And you know, the male officer is just still standing off in the corner. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know, wow. So I was like, wow, we, we do can sometimes make a difference, you know. And also there's another thing when we used to go on um, domestic, you know, domestic incidents, domestic violence cases, and there'd be a look of relief on a woman's face when she saw another female. And I have to also say it didn't necessarily mean I was going to side with her, you know, if there was this, you know, big thing going on and she's lying, it doesn't mean simply because I'm female, she's female, I'm going to take her side or back her up, you know. But uh, but in other times, I've definitely seen the uh, look of relief on their face because most, for many, many years, you know, it would be two male cops showing up. And uh, so luckily that's changed. But 
hopefully the men are, are you know, and like and like uh, Susie said, I mean, there's there are great ones out there. I'm not putting a big blanket over the bad ones, but uh, you know, sometimes it's just it's it's that humanity thing. It's just again, mm -hmm. if if you were in that position, what would you want to do for uh, someone that was in pain or hurting? You know, it's just basic common sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of just second nature, just. Yeah. It can't be helped, if you will. Yeah. Sure. Or if, you know, if this was your aunt, your uncle, your grandmother, whatever, you know, how would you want them mm -hmm. to be treated? That's what you do. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I was I was thinking when you have those the um, misconceptions. One of my friends, she was um, she's now she's no longer in law enforcement, but she said one of the things that she was complimented on by the men. She was also um, she was the first female to um, be in the small town in the um, department. But one of the things that the men complimented her on was that she tended to bring a different side um, that not necessarily not, not not that they couldn't give it, but that um, she had more of the softer side where the guys are more of the gruff. Let's this done type of thing, but she was able to um, bring something to the table with a female who was being interrogated, but once they saw her or whatever, there was a, like you said, a relief, this kind of, oh, okay, maybe she'll kind of understand, or um, she can, she's another, she's, here's another female, maybe this will, maybe I can talk to her type of thing. So I, I think that really kind of goes hand in hand too. I think that's I think that's true. So when we go back to writing our characters, a lot of the things we've learned and we uh, understand is that most viewers actually um, believe what they see on TV, and we discussed that earlier. And I want to come back to how that can cause a problem for. Um, in reality and when writing books because it's automatic. I had another writer who, and she, she's one of the reasons what helped prompt me to get some of the stuff I've been doing going because a lot of her, two of her books that she had written, she hadn't published it yet, um, was written because of what she saw on TV, meaning um, she that was her research, mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. you will. And come to find out <laughs> after she had Watch the first one we had did in um, November of last year when we were all on. She said, "Oh my God, I have to go back and rewrite the entire book." Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> ouch, ouch, ouch. Um, where is there besides our common sense? Is there just some things that we? need to draw the line on or kind of learn to draw the line on like you know the big computer screens or whatever that's on TV it's really not true and in departments what do you think about that where is there a line to when do you draw the line <laughs> hmm I don't you know, know what do you think Susie go ahead well <laughs> the thing is I think it is a very fine line because we are talking about fiction here, I'm assuming, and mm -hmm, you do mm -hmm. want to entertain. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of what I do is not very entertaining. Um, a lot of what I do is extremely boring. Um, if you want to talk about 90% paperwork, um, you know, and want a very authentic yeah. book, um, your detective, your police officer is always going to be sitting in front of their freaking computer screen typing, yes. um, which is going to be very boring, you know. So you do have to have this fine line, and you know, of of wanting to be entertaining. I think that putting the human aspect of of your person um, in there, you know, one of the things, and and this kind of goes to another question too, and combines them both. Um, but the the men in my department had a really hard time um, with with facing the fact that I cry. Now I don't cry out at a scene. Um, I don't cry in front of other people. There's been times I've come close, but the last thing they want to see is their police officer fall to pieces. 
But when I'm away from that scene, when I get into my office, when I get into the police department, I don't care about the guys. I, it, I am emotional. Um, I, I do cry. It's an outlet for me that they don't tend to use. Very rarely have I seen them use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I do. They have a hard time dealing with this. And if I've just seen a, a baby die, Mm. Um, I'm going to be able to keep it together. You know, if I picked a baby up, which has happened um, out of a car seat that wasn't fastened in the, the mm -hmm. seat belt, um, the, the baby was upside down on the road, the baby's dead. Um, you know what? I'm going to go home. I am going to drink alcohol. I am going to cry. Um, I may not wait until I get home. I will for the alcohol, but I won't for the tears. Um, I've driven away from a scene with, with tears running down my face. Um, I, you know, I, I think you need to put the human aspect in your books. For them to be entertainment, you still mm -hmm. have to add that human side. Um, you know, some of what you see on TV, it, it is, it's purely entertainment. But it gets the ratings, it gets the people in, and you've got to walk that fine line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah, Kathy. I, I, I agree. It's, um, like Susie said, um, you know, 90% of it is really boring. So, no, we can't put them to sleep. <laughs> you know, I know. That, unless that's what they want to do, you know, and read something for them to sleep. It's, you know, because I, I, I just, something else came to mind when um, I went to a call and it was a man who had really bad asthma and he was dead at the kitchen table and his girlfriend found him like that. And uh, we, uh, we all waited outside for the Emmy to come to make pronouncement. And my sergeant came to the scene, and he was chatting with the other police officer, happened to be male. And, uh, you know, the, the poor woman is there, boyfriend's dead in the kitchen. And the two guys were off to having a conversation, and they're laughing. And, you know, they're not laughing at the situation. They're laughing at something else because they went on. But I still felt like... I don't care if you're not talking about that or not. It just seems inappropriate, you know, to be laughing because our cops do go on, and there are, you know, there's cop humor, but there's time and place for that. Um, but uh, I think, you know, all writing, I think, is about the human experience and expressing that, and the purpose of most fiction is to evoke emotion. So, uh, you know, make the cop real. And, yeah, it could be a guy or a girl, but they're going to cry. I remember one time um, I went to a scene where, oh, it was two elderly women, and they were sisters. They, you know, they lived together, and one had died, and, you know, she was, she was crying. And for a moment I put myself in her spot, and I thought about my sister, and what if I was that, you know, that age with that many years with my sister, and I was going to make my, my I was going to cry. And I thought, whoop, I gotta stop that. I can't I can't think about that, you know, at least right now. I don't wanna cry. But it, it certainly can happen. And uh, especially in the cases of babies, mm -hmm. you know, there's just heartbreaking things that go on, you know, or a parent or grandparent coming to the scene of a fatal car accident and they're gonna be heard the worst news possible. You know, so it would be like uh, it it would be abnormal to not react to that. You know, but again, people look up to cops as if they're put together, they can handle it, you know, they're the rock, you know, but sometimes, uh, you know, inside they're not. So, nothing wrong with writing well, and truth, think, you know. Right, and I think it's important that uh, we as writers understand it's important research. I'm just a huge fan on research, but we also... So again, I'll say it for the third time, we do not want to bore our readers because we sprinkle, you know, drama, action, a little bit of humor, whatever it is, but you also want to make sure that what we have in our books is correct and we're not writing ten pages of boring stuff because, you know, we're trying to prove, hey, I did this research, but just the fact that... Um, if somebody reads it, they'll know at least, okay, well, the writer did. She took her time here. She took her time to um, find out this information is important. And another thing is when writing crime fiction, and I've learned that it's totally different than just 
mystery. Now that's just for me, just because of mystery you have to do research, but with crime fiction it's more sort of on the procedural side. And I have learned that it's something that you have to learn to separate. You have to learn to not be swallowed up by the television. And television is great. I love television, so I'm not I'm not speaking bad about it, but when it comes down to the work and you're putting out a book, you're going to want to make sure that you have what it is that you need and that you have the correct information. And so that's what I was um, looking to have explained and you two have done very well. Thank you so much for just indulging in the questions because um, even if some of them sound repetitive, but I thought it was important that we no, hey, this is what it's like. Your characters have to be real. You want them to be real. You want them to have human feelings. You don't want them perfect um, because then they're boring and nothing's happened. Um, the female characters, though, I wonder, I have yet to write um, the a male character as my um, protagonist. Is the difference, do you think there's a difference with the male versus um, female when the author is male female behind it? Do you think there's a difference? Hmm. I don't know. With how they write it? But because what I mean is they say a lot of the females we tend to write female characters just because we can identify but I have some writer friends who they own the females they only write um, their protagonist is male. Mm. Mm. Well, that could be in the case where uh, if it's a female author who's had many um, men in her life, her father, her brother, her uncle, and <coughs> cops, they, you know, it's like secondhand to them. So that's very mm -hmm. comfortable and easy for them. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever read something where um, I don't think they carried it off. You know, if it was a female writing about a male or a male writing about a female, I've, I don't know, I've always believed it. It didn't seem unreal to me, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I, I've done both, I've, I, I've definitely written stories where, um, you know, the, uh, there's a male cop as the protagonist, and I've done it with a female cop as a protagonist, so it hasn't stopped me from, from doing it, well, good. And, you okay. know, so okay. as Susie knows, most, most female cops are, you know, they're the minority, you know, in, in the police department, so, we kind of know really what it's like to work with guys, <laughs> you know? Well, and I think we actually pick up a lot of their characteristics um, because that is who we work with. <laughs> we work with men. Mm -hmm. We, mm -hmm. I know for yeah. myself because in my fiction, I write both the male and female point of view. And mm -hmm. I understand part of that male point of view better than I ever did before I became a police officer. And I feel I write very good men um, because of that. And so, you know, I, I think you can write both. And But I do think, like Kathleen said, it helps to have um, strong men in your family or, you know, men you hang out with that, that you understand, you know. Um, a lot of stuff, something I really enjoy doing as a writer, and I, I just was given this op opportunity recently um, on our way to California on vacation. We stopped in Vegas for a few days, and I sat down in the Starbucks um, it, below in the casino, and I people watch. I watch the way men mm. interact with other men. I watch the way women interact with, with, with men. Um, but my eyes tend to glue more towards the men. Um, and, you know, because I know the female side of it. So um, I do. I, you know, I pay attention. I don't think you need to be a police officer to go out there and people watch and pay attention to the men that are around you and, and how they react to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an mm -hmm. excellent exercise for any yeah. writer to do. Is people watch. It, it yep. is. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. Yeah. That's a great right, idea. As long as it doesn't look creepy, you know. No, but, yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> subterfuge. No, I <laughs> people watch keep, too. Keep your business I'm card. <laughs> keep, keep, your yeah. like, keep your business card, your writer card. So when somebody's really you're creeping them out, you just say, "Here, I'm a writer." You know, <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a writer. That's okay. <laughs> For me, I'll have my badge on me. I'll say, oh, I'm a cop. Oh, yeah. man. 
Yes. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, ladies, <laughs> their time has went uh, pretty fast besides, you know, me ducking in and out of the show. Um, I want just to say thank you guys, and I will be bugging you guys again probably next month for us to do this again. But um, thank you guys for giving and taking the time. Um, no, it's, it's my pleasure. Sharing the information that you did. Before we go, is <laughs> awesome, thank you. Before we go, is there any little from... Um, one writer to another. Is there something that you guys want to say uh, before you go? Um, you know Maybe. what? Keep <laughs> writing. I don't. I don't care. Um, you know, if this is your first book, if this is your fifth book or your tenth book, keep writing. I get better with every book I write. Mm -hmm. um, I get more comfortable in my writing. Um, and so many people come up to me and say, "I wrote this book." You need to be able to walk up to people and say, I wrote 10 books. And because mm -hmm. that's when people will start following you. That's when they'll start paying attention. Um, writing that one book, get it finished, do the best you can, get it, get it out there. Get it, get it, put it on the back burner and start on something new. That would be my biggest advice right. to writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, All right. I, I absolutely yeah. agree. <laughs> yep, absolutely agree. Keep writing, keep writing, and don't let um, fear of either the blank page or if you're going to get it right. You know, we call it like the first draft, uh, you know, there's many words for it, but sometimes it's called a vomit draft. You know, just get it out on paper and then, you know, you clean it up. And of course, like a big thing of clay, and then you're going to mold it as you go. You'll find your story as you go along. You know, don't wait for the story to be fully formed in your head before you put pen to paper or fingertips to the keyboard. Just go for it because there's something inside you that wants to tell a story and you got to go for it. So. I think we still have more with us. Yep, you still there, honey? I don't know. She's frozen again. Hey, Ashton, thank you for. You still there? Yeah. Okay. I think. Ah, there you are. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, it was okay. a pleasure. Thank you for having um, us. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely. So, thank you. Ladies, stick around and thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll talk. We'll meet again soon. Thank you. It was really good. I, I did like, I, I served on three panels.